Hello, everyone. In what follows, I am going to take you on a tour of Western Colorado, sharing with you what my staff and I have learned about the hazards posed directly and indirectly to human health and the environment by natural gas production and delivery. I got involved when government incentives to explore and develop natural gas in 2002 led to a company announcing that it would be drilling for natural gas on the top of the Grand Mesa, one of the largest flat-topped mountains in the world, and what my county and other counties consider our watershed. At that time, natural gas operations had already increased significantly across the western half of the state, reflecting the administration's desire to become less dependent on foreign energy, and the administration announcing a moratorium on the use of federal environmental laws to regulate natural gas activity. Then there was another surge in natural gas activity after Congress passed the 2005 Energy Appropriations Bill with a clause that made official the administration's moratorium on the use of the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, CERCLA, the Superfund Act, and NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, to regulate the industry. Throughout my talk, I will use Colorado as a model for what you might want to think about as natural gas activity commences in your region. But keep in mind that our Western ecosystem is unique, just as the ecosystem where you live is unique, and modifications may be needed to best protect your health and those special features related to your life support systems, water and air. Here, you see natural gas wells on each side of the Colorado River. The source of water for over 30 million people downstream. You can also see the four lane west to east Interstate 70. This picture looks to the east where you can see the haze over the mountains up towards Aspen. Out here, the weather moves from the southwest to the northeast under most conditions. And you should be thinking about the weather patterns that are specific for your area as we move through this talk. This picture was taken several miles downstream from the last picture, showing how gas activity spreads. You should be able to see the Colorado River in the bottom left and right-hand corners of the picture with I-70 as well. Here, there is approximately one well pad on every 35 or 40 acres. Today, in Colorado, as in Wyoming, you can find one well pad on every 10 acres. And if you look closely, you will see that each well pad has an open evaporation pit, something that the state of New York, for instance, does not allow because the evaporation rate there is so low. In most instances, when gas comes up from the ground, it comes up wet. And for the production life of the well, that water has to be removed and put somewhere. Here in the West, it ends up in an open pit or a holding tank above or below ground. Tanks that have to be emptied on a regular basis for the life of the well. Or the water can be trapped and re-injected on the site or piped to a central injection site. You can see a huge open evaporation pit on the side of the mountain that services the wells in that area. Large water trucks operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week to haul the water from the pads to here where they unload the water at the top and let it trickle down over the tiered ponds. You might be able to see the misters, the little white dots in the uppermost pit with water in it. From here on, we will start looking at four stages of natural gas operations where chemicals are found. Drilling, where the hole is made to reach the gas. Fracking, 
where the underground is fractured to facilitate the release of the gas. Processing, where objectionable material is removed from the gas. And then the handling of the waste, chemicals, and other byproducts. I show this picture because the drilling activity you see here, hundreds of feet above the road, is taking place in the headwaters of a river that feeds a reservoir several miles down the road to the left of the picture. That reservoir provides a large part of the agricultural and drinking water for the valley I live in. I could not capture all the wells in the picture because I wanted to show where this activity took place in relation to the road. The reason I show this is to point out that this activity is on private land and not in the county where I live. All the revenues from that activity will go to the landowner and another county. My county has no control over what is taking place in our watershed that lies in another county. Yet it was our county that had to put up with the huge trucks hauling gravel, sand, and water on a narrow two-lane highway with no shoulders while this activity was taking place, leaving our roads full of potholes. This is not a unique situation. It is happening across the country. This well was being drilled again on private land surrounded by national forest land in the same region shown in the last picture. The reserve pit is lined with white material to hold the cuttings from the drill pipe on one side and the fluids and muds that surface during drilling on the other side. These pits are supposed to be filled in within 30 days after the well is completed. Now if you look below the white lined pit, you will see a larger pit still being dug for the water that will come off the gas as it surfaces. This is a vertical well, and it can take as long as three to four weeks to drill depending on how deep the gas is and the geology in the area. An investment in a well like this is around $800,000. Now this is a mature pad from Garfield County along Divide Creek where a new well was being drilled. You can easily see the temporary reserve pit to the left of the drill rig that is collecting cuttings and fluids as the well is being dug. And also the larger evaporation pit that has been in operation since the first well was completed on this pad to hold the water recovered from the gas as it comes from the ground. We were surprised that drilling was taking place on this pad because several years earlier, methane began to bubble up in Divide Creek and escaped from the ground in the neighborhood. A major corporation was fined $350,000 over the incident. Neighbors insist that escaping methane is still a problem there today. Within the last two years, we began to find large operations like this. I expect that this may be what the large energy operators will be proposing as natural gas leases are being sold and permitted in other regions of the country. This is a horizontal or directional drilling operation, and an investment like this would be about $2.5 million or more. It is here in the Rhone Plateau area where the latest technology is being tried out. It is supposed to be the most economically efficient way to produce gas. There are two drill rigs operating on this pad. Perhaps using a diamond drill or one of the newer bits that can cut drilling time in more than half. There are already 10 wells on this pad. See the 10 condensate tanks and the 10 pipes beside them called Christmas trees where the gas comes up from the ground. Those two double-ride trailers are called a man camp. The workers often stay on the pads around the clock until the drilling ceases. We were told that there would eventually be 28 or 30 wells on this pad, and each well can be fracked 10 times. So easy math means that there could be 
280 or 300 fracturing incidents done from this pad alone. So what is fracking? Well, industry has started to use the term stimulation instead of fracking for the operational stage. Wells are fractured in order to increase their productivity. Extremely high levels of pressure are continually maintained down the pipe to pump fluids to various designated depths, and then using the latest state-of-the-art explosives at each perforation in the pipe, it causes what the industry describes as mini earthquakes. In this stage, as much as a million gallons or more of fluids are injected under high pressure. In the Marcella Shale and Barnett Shale areas, called slick water areas, according to estimates coming out of Pennsylvania and New York State, the companies are planning to use 2.5 to 3.4 million gallons of fluid per frac. Fracking technology will differ among various parts of the country depending on how and in what matrix the gas is entrapped. Now this is an artist's simple conception of what fracking looks like. In the top left, you see huge compressor trucks that are used to maintain high pressure throughout the procedure, sometimes as long as 36 hours around the clock. The tanks depict the large volumes of diesel fuel that must be available at all times to keep all of the equipment running once the procedure starts. Notice that the drill rig is gone. To the right, try to picture dozens of fracking tanks which hold the fluids to be injected underground. These are on wheels with lots of fittings for pipes and hoses as large as a train car with vents on top. The tanks also serve as receptacles for the fracking fluids when they come back up to the surface as the compressors shut down and the pressure drops and the procedure comes to an end. Here you see the pipe inserted vertically into the ground, penetrating many geological layers. Here in western Colorado, gas is found at various depths from 4,000 feet to 8,000 feet and in the San Luis Valley, 10,000 to 12,000 feet. What you see here is vertical fracking, and we show four different fractures extending from the pipe every 60 degrees or less. Each one of the vents made from the perforation can extend about 2,000 feet and may only be a couple of inches in height. Now they would extend far out beyond the edge of this picture. We could not do it in our animation with what we had here in our facility. Each frack would be done separately, starting from the bottom up, at different depths at about every 1,000 to 1,500 feet. Now horizontal drilling involves gradually making the borehole bend after the hole reaches a predetermined depth. Engineers start bending the pipe when they are sure they are below any possible usable water. And out here in the west, that would be at about a depth of 400 feet. The drilling equipment has to be changed at this point as the bend starts. And to complete the bend so that the bore is finally horizontal, it takes as much as 2,500 feet of pipe. And according to the literature, once the pipe is horizontal, it can then be extended another 2,000 feet or more. Now the advantage of this is that there has to be no equipment above ground from which the gas will be extracted, which could be almost a mile in any direction surrounding the bore hole. During the procedure, numerous chemicals in various combinations are added to the fluids that are injected underground. The chemicals range from biocides, powerful chemicals used to kill bacteria that can live without oxygen as well as those that need oxygen. Because bacteria can produce acids that eat pipes and fittings and produce a toxic gas, hydrogen sulfide, that smells like rotten eggs and is highly toxic, and because they can alter also the physical characteristics of some of the chemicals in the fluids that they are using, a lot of chemicals are used to make slurries slippery. 
from surfactants, lubricants, anything to reduce friction, like microfine silica, antioxidants, acids to foamers and propens to keep the fracture open after the explosion, polymers, alcohols, and acrylamides, all added to alter the underground strata to allow methane to escape up the pipe. The chemicals are not all added at the same time. They are introduced in stages very carefully, worked out by engineers who may be thousands of miles away at corporate headquarters. Like drilling, it's a noisy operation with compressors running, lit up at night as if it were daytime, and can go on for 36 hours or more. If you live nearby, you might be able to feel your house jiggle at each explosive event. Large diesel trucks are needed for many purposes, like dump trucks ready to mix in sand. You will see dump trucks and fracking tanks a, a tilt. They need the tanks to hold the fluids for the frack and later collect the fluids that come back up to the surface after compression stops. There are lots of pipes, lots of hoses. With smaller operations, there are 42 gallon drums of chemicals sitting around on backs of trucks with chemicals ready to be mixed into the slurry. Estimates range from about 20% to 80% of the fluids injected underground during fracking are recovered. But so far, we have not been able to find a publication where actual volumes were measured or ingredients analyzed and quantified. The recovered water can be re-injected on site or hauled off to be re-injected at a central site or in the west at times put in open evaporation pits. No fluids were recovered from those wells I showed you up the valley from my home. Now here is an actual fracking going on and I've gone back to this picture because it gives me the opportunity to introduce the fact that water is not the only life support system at risk in producing natural gas. Air quality is also at risk. Up until three years ago, air quality got little attention in the gas fields. Little consideration had been given to the amount of diesel that is burned to produce natural gas. When you add up the exhaust from the labor force's diesel trucks, and the corporate trucks and huge machinery needed to extract the gas, the exhaust begins to reach very high levels that contain NOx, nitrogen oxides, as well as volatile organic compounds, for short, called VOCs. When the nitrogen oxide, the NOxes and the VOCs float up into the air in presence of sunlight, they produce what is called ground-level ozone. It is now apparent that stationary and mobile equipment required to produce and deliver natural gas can cause an urban-like smog problem rich in ozone and especially in areas of high production. We need ozone in the stratosphere to protect us from the ultraviolet light, but at ground level it poses a serious threat to all animals, including humans, and plants, including the trees in our forests. One molecule of ozone can burn a hole in the deep alveolar tissue in your lungs. It is well documented that daily exposure to ozone leads to early aging of the lungs. They become brittle and dry out. The lungs cannot repair this kind of damage. Every exposure incident builds upon the damage that was already there. Chronic ozone exposure can cause asthma, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and other pulmonary disorders. Children are especially vulnerable because their lungs continue to grow and enlarge until about age 18. As they mature in the presence of ozone, their alveoli production is reduced, and they end up with brittle lungs like those of an 80-year-old. Ozone was always thought to be only an urban problem caused by the exhaust from gasoline combustion in automobiles, the NOxes, and the volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, from the gasoline fumes. 
the same VOCs that are released from natural gas operations. We now have in the West an urban air pollution phenomenon that no one suspected would happen. Now we came upon this fracking operation while we were looking for the tunnel that had been drilled through a mountain to reduce the long trip to a county road. There are already eight completed wells on this pad, if you look to the left and below the pad. You can see the eight condensate water holding tanks or produced water tanks. There are actually 35 green fracking tanks, each about the size of a train car, nested side by side to the left of the pad. 35 more along the back, and zooming in on it at our office, we counted almost 100 tanks on this pad. You can see the white cabs of at least eight generator and chemical mixing trucks lined up near the hole where all the activity is taking place. Now processing. When the gas first comes from the ground, the water must be stripped off as well as other gases like pentane, propane, and the noxious gases that include benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, called the BTEXs. So before the natural gas, or methane, moves into the local delivery pipe system, it has to be dried and cleaned up a little. Here is a pad where drilling has ceased and the wells are now set up to produce gas, perhaps for another 25 years. There are five wells on this pad. See the shadow to the left of the picture? That is one of the interesting looking contraptions called Christmas trees in the foreground. That is where the gas comes up from the ground from each well on the pad. To the right, you can see a solar panel that monitors the air temperature, and when it gets near freezing, it releases methanol or wood alcohol. From that white tank in the gas, right into the gas coming out of the ground to prevent the pipes from freezing. Now this is a very important safety factor. To the left and to the back you can see the separator unit with five glycol dehydrators. Now as the gas comes up out of the ground it is passed through a liquid in the separator column called ethylene glycol. When that ethylene glycol gets saturated with water then it is heated and the water is evaporated off to, the, to condense into the tanks that I will show you in a minute. Those noxious gases I mentioned, such as BTEX, and I'll mention them once more, benzene, ethylbenzene, toluene, and xylene, are allowed to vent off here. The orange arrow points at a pipe for flaring off those gases when the pressure gets high enough. And it is important to keep in mind that throughout all the processes you have seen so far, a great deal of natural gas is escaping as well. And natural gas, or methane, is a far more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Now here are the five holding tanks. Uh, sorry, the way we took this picture you cannot see all of them. These tanks are supposed to be bermed so that if 75% of the fluid in the tank were to leak, all of it would be contained on the site. And for the life of this pad, as long as it keeps producing gas, water trucks will have to come and haul off the condensate. Now what you see on this pad is called stationary equipment. The vehicles that serve as stationary units are referred to as mobile equipment. And air pollution comes now from both stationary and mobile sources. This is a compressor unit, one of many needed along pipelines to keep the gas at a high enough pressure so that there is no backflow from the main delivery lines. Here you see two separate columns and no holding tanks. Since no one could be found here to talk with, we can only speculate that this is one of the new units where produced water is being stored in an underground tank, or perhaps being piped to a deep well injection site that was recently built in this area. In order to get the gas from the primary delivery system into the large long distance system that is run at 400 pounds per square inch, this unit has to be producing at 500 pounds per square inch. 
The generators moving those huge fans are located inside the building and they are producing NOx, the nitrogen oxides, and high levels of BTEX and other heavy volatiles. There is technology available today to build these as closed systems, capturing as much as 95% of the VOCs that would come off. The original capital outlay is a little high, but for the amount of gas that the new systems capture, the new units are paying off in three to five years. Gas has to be polished once more before it enters the interstate commercial delivery lines. Here you see a picture of a refinery in southwestern Colorado that releases huge volumes of foul-smelling nitrogen and sulfur-based volatile compounds. Because gas production is so high in this region of the state, British Petroleum built another refinery just up the road several miles, which we could not see from the road while we were there. This plant takes water out of the local river to wash the gas after the noxious substances have been removed. So in your planning, you need to take into consideration where a unit like this will be needed. Your organizations should be alert and watch for notices of intent to build one of these units in your area. And for economic purposes, they will most likely be built near a major pipeline. Waste fluids and sludge are handled in a number of ways. The following pictures are shown only to demonstrate that huge volumes of water must be dealt with in the production of natural gas. And in the West, we can count on evaporation. In the more humid areas of the country, that will not work. This is the evaporation pit for the wash water from the refinery I just showed you. Note the cannon-like apparatus shooting the water into the air to assist evaporation. And note how the berm around this pond is beginning to erode. Pits like this service large numbers of wells, usually for one operator. Look closely and you should be able to see the red cab on the water truck unloading. A unit like this is another source for the release of nitrogen oxides, diesel, and VOCs. We could see no netting over these pits. This facility accepted truckloads of fluids from small developers and wildcatters from a radius of about 50 miles or more. No sampling or accounting for the chemicals in the incoming fluids took place at this unit or any other disposable units that we've looked into. When the pits dry out and become sludge, the residue is then land farmed. It is disked into the soil and supposed to be biodegradable. However, the biocides used during drilling and fracking would undoubtedly make the land incapable of producing much vegetation and certainly allow no biodegradation. Quite a few of the products on our Colorado list contain silica which when it dries will readily blow about as dust. Silica dust can cause silicosis, a serious lung disorder that can lead to a rapid and lethal form of lung cancer. And also fine dust particles increase the smog or haze effect of ozone. In 2003, the highly respected nationwide oil and gas watchdog organization, OGAP, asked us about the health effects of the chemicals used in gas operations and started sending us lots of material safety data sheets, the MSDS sheets, that are attached to products that contain hazardous chemicals. That was when one of our staff and a pre-doctoral student from MIT on a National Science Foundation grant working with us for the summer set out to systematically set up a database in order to look at the long list of chemicals that we had at hand. As they began to look closely at the health effects, a consistent pattern or profile of the health categories kept popping up based on 14 traditional toxicological categories used in government publications. The last time this program was updated for Colorado alone, there were 246 products and 278 chemicals on our list. 
93% of the 246 products had identifiable health effects. The other 7% represent the products for which we had limited information because the ingredients were listed as either proprietary or the names were too general or no ingredients were listed. And five of the products on, list, on this list had no ingredient information at all. Of those products that had health effects, 14% had one to three effects and 86% had four to 14 effects. And what surprised us was to find that 43% of the products on our list contain endocrine disruptors, chemicals that can interfere with the development of individuals before they are born and cause irreversible lifetime changes in their health and how they function later in life. Wildlife, starting at the lowest level in the food web, has proven to be sensitive to chemicals of this nature at ambient or what we call environmental concentrations. We then looked at the chemicals based on their major pathway exposure. Were they soluble? Could they evaporate? And we were able to identify 63% of the 278 chemicals on our list using what are called CAS numbers, the American Chemical Society's Chemical Abstract System. The CAS number made it possible to specifically search the literature for the health effects of these chemicals. And we created the following bar graphs based on the results of literature searches. Looking at the water-soluble chemicals alone, this is the health profile they produced. The bars tell you how often a certain health category is associated with all of the chemicals on the list. In other words, if you look at the, at the screen, you will see that approximately 95% of the chemicals on the list could irritate the eyes, the skin, and cause sensitization, in other words, trigger allergies. And remember, a chemical can have up to 14 health effects. And it turned out that those health categories are vital systems most associated with the chemicals, starting from left to right, are the skin, eye, and sensory organs that I just mentioned, respiratory tract, stomach, liver, the brain and the nervous system. The adverse health effects expressed by those systems in many cases would occur shortly after exposure. These are conditions that may not often be brought to the attention of clinicians because they seem minor. Itching, burning skin, burning eyes, sore throats, nausea, headaches, sinusitis, flu-like symptoms, sensitization, fatigue, dizziness, mild tingling in the extremities that can lead to permanent nerve damage that is irreversible. Or if severe, the person would be brought to the emergency room first for treatment for direct exposure to burns on the skin, for example. The other health categories, continuing on from left to right, include ecological effects, cardiovascular in the heart, the immune system, other, that includes bone damage and death, the reproductive system, development, mutagenicity, cancer, and endocrine disorders. All health problems that would not be expressed immediately, but could turn up as chronic health problems months or years later. And they could never be traced directly to industrial exposure. And here you see the profile associated with the identifiable volatile compounds that is almost the same but with greater frequency and more chemicals are linked with the chronic long-term disorders. It is important to point out here where cancer lies on the graph. This analysis reveals that 38% of the chemicals can cause cancer compared to 78% of the chemicals that can cause brain and nervous system damage. Maybe we should be more interested in these other health effects to the left when determining the health risks caused by the chemicals used in this industry. This is a picture of one of the corporate 400 bed man camps to house the gas field workers to make sure they have enough people to work around the clock. Men are being flown into Colorado from Canada to work for four weeks 12 hours on and 12 hours off around the clock and never leave the gas patch until they fly back to Canada for two weeks off 
and then back to Colorado again. Local laborers generally work 12-hour shifts as well, and men coming off their ships are exhausted. They complain of severe headaches and have other complaints matching some of what I mentioned earlier. Now, for a long time, we believed what the developers were telling us, that drilling muds are benign, that they are safe, until we got an urgent request to see if we had any information about 40 products used in Wyoming during drilling. There had been a serious blowout during a routine drilling operation in Wyoming. And this was a new well where the drillers got to a depth of 8,000 feet and something went wrong with the casing near the surface. And at an extremely high pressure, the well began to blow out. There were two major cracks at the surface from which the muds and gases flew up into the air and ooze came out of the road cuts and ran down the county road. It took 57 hours to get under control. Now this was adjacent to a housing development and it was not surprising to hear that the people living in the area had to be evacuated using respirators and stay away from their homes for days because of the noxious fumes. This graph shows what we were able to learn about the chemicals spilled when a fracking mixing chemical truck was involved in an accident in Garfield County, Colorado on one of those narrow two-lane county roads. The truck heading to a fracking operation spilled 318 gallons of material that contained four products. According to the MSDS sheets, there were 15 different chemicals involved. Here you can see how they fell out by health category. The column on the farthest left in this case covers ecological effects. They all would have had an effect on the environment in some way or another, like the fish, invertebrates, and plants. And here you see the profile for the volatiles, and here you see the profiles for the water-soluble chemicals. All four were associated with all the health categories we show here. We were sent the test results from six New Mexico evaporation pits that are scheduled to be shut down in the near future. The health effects of the 51 chemicals and metals that were detected produced a health pattern even more hazardous than the patterns of the chemicals found in our spreadsheets for the state of New Mexico. In addition, some of the chemicals were found at extremely high concentrations, well above New Mexico and federal safety levels. But only eight chemicals detected in the pits matched the chemicals used in New Mexico. Upon looking at the chemical testing protocols used in the New Mexico pit study, we found that except for naphthalene, they did not test for the other chemicals that we have on our list that are being used in New Mexico. And we found that over 90% of the chemicals reported in the pits are on the CERCLA or the Superfund list of toxic chemicals. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 2005 and the EPCRA Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act and the EPCRA list of lists of 2006, which raises questions about how they got into the pits. Now keep in mind that of all the products on our list for all states, we know nothing about the composition for almost 40% of them, and only know the full composition for a little more than 10% of them. Now let's get away from the pits and go back up into the mountains for a minute. It is a rare day in the West anymore when we can take a picture without a blue haze destroying the vistas. Here you see the high country where gas development is encroaching on our beautiful forests and mountain meadows and in a major western watershed. Recently, scientists at NOAA reported wintertime ozone in the Wyoming, Jonah, Pinedale, anticline gas fields rising to more than 140 parts per billion. Two years ago, Pinedale and the Jackson Hole area hit 155 parts per billion. At that time, they had to shut down the ski areas 
and actually close the schools and not let children go outside in that area. That was twice, more than twice, the compliance level that EPA has established for ozone, which is 75 parts per billion. And even at 75 parts per billion, EPA scientists admit that anything, any increment in parts per billion above 40 parts per billion, you can begin to see measurable health effects among our children, among the newborn, and among the aged. Our Rocky Mountain forests lie right in the path of the air pollutants from gas and oil development to the west and could easily be caught in an ozone plume. Ozone plumes can extend over 200 miles. Like the alveoli in our lungs, the stomata in leaves on deciduous trees and needles on conifers suffer ozone burn. This leads to reduced growth rates, increased susceptibility to disease, and early death have all been blamed on ozone in evergreen forests, commercial tree species to fruit trees, food and forage crops, hay and alfalfa, starting at 50 parts per billion. These recent readings were more than double that. The trees in our mountain forests in the west are the keepers of our water. They make it possible for us to have water year round. Not only does ozone pose a direct threat to human health, it also poses a covert threat to our already marginal freshwater supply in the West by weakening the trees. But we know now that wherever natural gas operations are going to commence or increase, air pollution must be treated as seriously as water pollution. Downwind effects on agriculture and those living in rural areas must now be taken into consideration. We need to know a lot more. Products must be labeled with a complete formulation along with the quantity or concentration of every chemical used in the product. And most important, identification of the fluids that are used to fill the product containers to the brim. The source and quality of all water used to fracture must be accounted for as well as the formulation or how much of each product is used in the fracking fluids. Dangerous chemicals are being mixed in large quantities in the gas fields by people who have no idea what they are using. Even the bosses have no idea what is being used. Yet they will stand by the company's mantra that the chemicals are safe. The amount of fluids injected and recovered during fracking should be public information. Data should be made public about the chemical composition of what is in pits, on the well pads, and also in the offside waste disposal areas. From a life support system perspective in the West, we better find out how much of the water being taken from the Colorado River drainage basin to produce natural gas is being returned to the Colorado River system. Will this affect the Colorado River Compact commitments to the states downstream? This applies to all river drainages across the country, even in areas of high precipitation as in the east. As the size and intensity of natural gas extraction increased over the past decade, so have the numbers and the amounts of chemicals increased putting air and water resources and more people at risk. And from a public health perspective, the time has come for full disclosure. Realistic comprehensive water monitoring programs must be set up that include numerous downslope sites, miles away at outcroppings, watering holes, springs, creeks, and domestic wells where chemicals injected underground might eventually surface. Although it is too late already in some areas, baseline monitoring of water quality and ozone should commence immediately in all other areas where activity is going to start. No matter where the activity is taking place geographically, someone should be charged with quantifying both agricultural and drinking water depletion, and especially in light of climate change. 
Now, our information reveals not only immediate, but chronic and latent hazards are posed to human and wildlife health from chemical contaminants being introduced in our watersheds, but also an emerging threat to our air that will not go away until the gas fields shut down and the stationary and mobile sources associated with processing and delivering gas are no longer in operation. This generally is not discussed when the impacts of gas production are under consideration. We must think in terms of prevention. Thank you for listening. Without the support of these organizations and people, we would not have been able to bring you this presentation. And for the list of chemicals being used, go to TEDx's website, www.endocrinedisruption.org, and look at our natural gas program. We will be updating it regularly, and you can learn more about fracking fluids there. And most important, while you are at our site, go to the Endocrine Disruption Program and look at the fossil fuel connection. It will give you more reason to seek other, more sustainable sources of energy than fossil fuels. <laughs>